As COVID-19 emerged in late 2019 and early 2020, we recognised quickly at SCORE that this had the potential to be a significant event for society and then also for our clients and our business. We realised we needed to build a deep understanding of the virus, the medical aspects in terms of how it impacts on us, the scientific background, public health management, the behavioural dimensions and the likely various state and political actions. We're fortunate at SCORE to have a strong range of internal expertise with access to medical and epidemiological experts and to have excellent data analytics and actuarial capabilities. Among other things, this has allowed us to build a proprietary epidemiological model, which provides us with projections of future outcomes. But we also realised that COVID-19 was a new type of situation where we needed to learn and seek out the best external expertise. And so we engaged with a range of different global experts across a number of areas, we spoke to doctors, epidemiologists, immunologists, virologists, and public health experts. We even spoke to a biotech investor who was really insightful in terms of being able to give a good view on the progress of different vaccine candidates. There was obviously a lot of noise around COVID at the start, and the key was to find experts that were best able to manage the uncertainty and still communicate their emerging knowledge clearly. Personally, I found Twitter an excellent tool to access the right sources of information quickly, Following this social media trail, you got not only the usual bite-sized updates, but could also readily find links to the most useful articles or emerging research. And it was on this Twitter trail that I found our guest today, Professor Robert Wachter, Chair of the Department of Medicine at UCSF. Bob will introduce himself properly shortly, but once I'd found him on Twitter, I quickly found his multi-tweet updates an indispensable source of medical and scientific knowledge on COVID-19 and as importantly, a source of hope and humanity in a challenging time. I reached out to Bob and we at SCORE have had the benefit of being able to talk regularly to him during the pandemic, which has been hugely helpful for us in continuing to build our knowledge on this crucial topic. We will have the chance today to hear from Bob on where we stand now with COVID-19, what comes next, and what might be the longer term implications for us of having gone through this pandemic. Hi, Bob. Thanks very much for joining us today. Do you, do you want to give us a bit of background on yourself and your involvement with COVID-19 to start, maybe? Sure. I'm a physician. I'm a general internist and uh, I'm something called a hospitalist, which is a field I helped start. Uh, I only take care of sick people in hospitals. My day job is I run the Department of Medicine at the University of California, San Francisco. So I have about a thousand academic physicians that work for me. Uh, my research has been on everything. Uh, I've told people my career only makes sense if you think of a political science major becoming an academic physician. So I've studied how care should be organized, how to improve care. Uh, I've studied patient safety and medical mistakes. Last six or seven years, I've studied the digitization of healthcare. And when COVID launched, I just thought it was obviously the most important and interesting problem in the world. And my kind of odd skill set of being uh, a little bit of an expert, enough in epidemiology, virology, sociology, politics might be useful in trying to weave together what's going on and explain it to other people. So I've spent a lot of time on scientific communication for the past year. Yeah, I can reassure you it's been super useful. I, I, I and many others have found it indispensable, frankly. It's been just a great way to learn about what's going on with COVID. But maybe to kind of jump into where we are now, Obviously, we're at an interesting stage in the U.S. where like vaccine rollout has been quite advanced. Where do you see us at and where do you see that that's going to go in the next few months? Yeah, I, I, we've been at an interesting stage for 15 months. It's just different. Interesting. <laughs> it keeps shifting. Uh, and it's been it, it really is one of the most remarkable things about this virus and pandemic. It's it, it has no shortage of surprises. And just when you think you're turning a corner, uh, sometimes there's an oncoming train. Um, in the U.S., I think we're in a pretty good place. The vaccine rollout after a, uh, a halting start in December and January has been tremendous. And the last three or four months now, we're averaging uh, 3 million doses a day. We've given 220 million vaccine injections out in the United States. I think it's sometimes easy to forget uh, you know, when I spoke to experts in vaccinology about a year ago and I said, when do you think we might have an effective vaccine and how effective will it be? The optimistic one said, maybe we'll have an effective vaccine out in March or April, like starting now, and maybe it'll be 60 or 70 percent effective. So the idea that we would have vaccines that are 90 ish percent effective and we would have injected 200 million doses in the U.S., 
is staggering, and it's it's easy to forget that, but I think important to remember. Uh, around the world, it it's it's the situation is more patchy. Uh, certain uh, industrialized and, and and wealthy countries have done well with vaccination. The UK and Israel being the most prime examples. Others have stumbled, and uh, particularly the European Union, I think, quite prominently. And there's a whole lot of the world that's almost completely unvaccinated. Ironically, the major producer of vaccine in the world, India, uh, has not vaccinated many people and is seeing an absolutely staggering surge. So the way I see the world now is sort of like the way I see the U.S. in a way. There are success stories, places doing well, but really terrible uh, areas that are doing quite poorly. And the U.S., the country by and large, is doing reasonably well, but there are still hot spots. And the main two explanations, well, the way I see it is the vaccines create a tremendous amount of downward pressure on the virus. Vaccines work magnificently well. And if you can vaccinate a lot of your population, you create a a, a very strong downward pressure on the transmission of the virus. On the other hand, you have two upward pressures on the transmission of the virus, one being these variants people have heard so much about. And the second being that when you have vaccines out there and cases start going down, people and politicians quite understandably begin letting down their guard. So you have essentially a three-way race. People talk about vaccines versus variants, but I see it as a three-way race between vaccines, variants, and behavior slash policy. And in the U.S., I think we are overall winning that race. In the last week or two, you begin to see our curve, which had been plateaued in cases for about a month, which was meaning meaning that race was essentially tied. You begin to see it come down. And even in the places that are very hot in the U.S., Michigan being the most prominent, it has begun coming down quite precipitously. So I think we're getting ahead of it, in part because we've gotten lucky. The main variant that we're seeing in the United States is the variant that originated in the UK. And it is, it's is it's bad, it's more infectious, it's probably a little bit more serious, but the vaccines appear to work perfectly well. So the thing that keeps me up at night is vaccine resistance rather than more infectious. So, it, so we're doing okay because that's our main variant and the more vaccine resistant or potentially vaccine resistant variants seem to be very small players in the US and aren't spreading very fast. In other parts of the world where you see cases skyrocket, for example, in India, these variants are coming into play and people are not on full lockdown and they have not gotten enough people vaccinated. So it's really the interplay of those three forces that are going to determine how things go over time. The U.S. is starting to do well. I don't know that it's going to be inexorable continued improvement because the real threat is the is, is a potentially different variant, one that is not only more infectious but vaccine resistant. So far, so good, but that's what we have to watch out for. And Bob, maybe when you talk about that third leg of the stool, the policy element, there, there's also very connected with that, I think probably you'd recognize the, the behavioral element as well, which I think feeds, it's fed into the way the containment has worked over the last 15 months, but it's probably also feeding now into the vaccine take up, which is going to be crucial in terms of where we go going forward. Maybe outline first, particularly from the US perspective where you're closest to, how you see that vaccine take up story developing and people's views and how that's emerging. Yeah, I'm 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 a little surprised and disappointed in what appears to be happening in the vaccine take up. I I I I shouldn't be so surprised after living through 2020, but I I guess I'm a little naive. Um, If you surveyed people six months ago about will you take this vaccine, a lot of people said I'm not sure. I'm you know, and and that was natural because the vaccine was brand new. We didn't know a lot about it. It was developed very very fast. And I think it was logical to have some concerns and maybe even a little hesitancy. My feeling was once the vaccines came out and and demonstrated themselves to be so unbelievably effective and COVID was not going away as if by a miracle, as our former president uh, predicted, uh, but uh, the only real counterforce against the COVID was the vaccines, uh, I thought people would would take it. And um, and what and and the real concern in the United States was in racial and ethnic minority groups, where there's a there is some tradition of vaccine uh, hesitancy, although I think that was overblown. I, I think when you look at the rate of uptake, for example, among blacks in the United States of vaccines, it's not particularly low. 
a lot of the vaccine hesitancy in the United States actually comes from the left. It comes from very liberal uh, populations. I live in San Francisco and in, around me, there are a whole lot of people who just don't believe in putting things in their body and all that. So that that's kind of uh, what we've seen on the on the in the front in in terms of uh, minority populations and poor neighborhoods is that there has not been terribly much vaccine hesitancy. Some, but the real issue was vaccine access. So we had to think of a system, you know, if you if the vaccine is hard to come by and you open up a vaccination center in a poor neighborhood, people drive in in their Lexuses from the suburbs to get it. So we had to figure out how do you get vaccines to poor people? And we've done very well there. What has emerged is vaccines have become the masks of 2021. It's become a partisan issue. The people who are center and left in the United States, which is the 50 to 60% of people are very much for the vaccine and 90 to 95% of people say they'll take it. If you look at uh, states that voted for Trump, so it really is a right left or blue red phenomena. You look at states that voted for Trump, you have about 40% of people saying they're not, they have not taken it and will not take it. That's the wrong call. The vaccines are remarkably good and safe, notwithstanding the, the, the hiccup we've had with the J and J, which we can talk about if you want. Um, but it may be, you know, in, in politics in the United States, people get locked in. They, they, they take their partisan stance. They go to their corner. They follow media and Facebook that speaks to them and encourages them to they're doing the right thing. These vaccines are dangerous. Uh, and so if that sticks, that's a problem, because if you add up the Republican, the number of Republican voters times 40 percent hesitancy, you end up with 20 or 25 percent of the country unwilling to be vaccinated. That is going to be too high a number, particularly if you add the children who are not going to be vaccinated in the short term, maybe in the long term they will. Uh, if, if you add that up, you don't get us to this sort of wonderful number uh, that's kind of a little bit of a myth. It's not like a a, a hard line, but this, this idea of herd immunity. So you will have a lot of people vaccinated. You will have a significant downward pressure on cases, but you will probably not, certainly in red states, have enough people vaccinated to make the virus essentially slink away because it can't find a willing host. So you may have a patchiness in the United States where certain areas where I live, for example, in San Francisco, our vaccine rate is almost twice that the national average. Cases have almost gone away. So you may have areas of the country that are almost little Israels where everybody's been vaccinated. There's very little virus around. You may have other parts of the country that pretty much follow the electoral map where a lot of people are unvaccinated. And you will see outbreaks in those areas, probably not of the type and the, 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 the death rates that we saw over the winter, but significant with significant deaths. There's another factor, sorry for going on so long, but it's complicated. There, there, there probably is some seasonality to this virus. So the summer may be better and people again will get a sense of security, change their habits, go back to uh, ditching the masks and, and, and forgetting about distancing. And so we may be in store in the United States for something of a surge that probably is going to be regional based on percent vaccination uh, in the fall and winter, particularly as people go back inside. That's the biggest risk that we face right now, in addition to, uh, to the risk of new variants that are even nastier than the ones that we've seen. So, so when you kind of discuss that regionalized picture, how does the, the situation stabilize? How do we get to uh, a new normal? Or, or is this new normal that we're going to continue to have outbreaks? And, and how do people like yourself in San Francisco with a high vaccination rate, how, how do you feel about living in the wider America? Can you go to different states? Do you have to control your behaviors in certain places? How does that play out? Yeah, it's a it, 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 the, the question you're asking, Redmond, on a national stage is also a local question, which is what to me is going to be the biggest political question in, in, in 2020, which is the issue of vaccine passports or vac vaccine authentication or vaccine requirements to go back to school or to work. And a lot of that hinges on how ultimately how protected the vaccinated are. So you have kind of two alternative worlds. One is the vaccinated are completely protected against getting sick and dying, uh, so much so that even if there are unvaccinated people around them, the vaccinated folks say, it's okay, you know, that's a bad choice from my perspective. Sorry if you get sick and die, but you've made a choice. And it sort of feels like smoking when we thought smoking only hurt the individual. 
The alternative is once we learned about secondhand smoke, it, the alternative is I don't want to be around you if you're unvaccinated, in part because I actually don't trust your judgment. Uh, you know, people have asked me, like, would you date an unvaccinated person? And I'd say no, the same reason I wouldn't date a smoker. I think they're making really bad decisions. But from a health standpoint, the uh, the way I feel right now, I've been fully vaccinated for four months. The vaccines are magnificent. I feel quite protected against very getting very sick and dying. But there have been a few reported cases of, of vaccinated people, certainly many cases of them getting COVID because because the you know when you're 95 percent or 72 percent, that means there are failures. People get COVID. Most of the cases are mild, but there have been cases of people getting sick and going to the hospital, and a rare case, probably one in a million, of going to of, of dying. Uh, and we also don't know for 100 percent certainty that if you get a mild case of COVID, if you're vaccinated, you can't get long COVID. And so all of that says to me, I feel pretty good. I get haircuts now. I see the dentist. I do things I wouldn't have done before, but I still will not dine inside a restaurant. Uh, and when I fly, which I do now, and I wouldn't have one before I was vaccinated, I keep my mask on the whole time because I do, still don't want to be around a crowd of strangers, some of whom are unvaccinated, in without masks. Perfectly comfortable with masks, but without masks, I still don't want to get COVID. So that colors the answer to your question, which is how safe do the vaccinated feel? And I think the answer is they're going to feel pretty safe, but still not going to want to hang around unvaccinated people. So that will color a decision, you know, if if Michigan is having a fair amount of COVID because there are a lot of unvaccinated people, if, you know, there are certain states where there are, they've taken away all of the restrictions, there are no mask mandates, and half the people are unvaccinated. If SCORE wants to have a big convention, are you going to have it in those places or are you going to go to a place where there's no COVID? I, I think, you know, businesses are going to begin to see this and start making some decisions about requiring vaccination. So that may turn out to be almost the biggest factor as we go forward for, you know, we're now at a place in the United States, really just right about now, where the curves are crossing, where they're, they're in many places in the United States, there is enough vaccine, there are not enough arms. And the question will be, does our society, the government's not going to step in here, I don't think, it's too politically risky, but will businesses, sports stadiums, uh, local mayors, local governors, will they step in and begin requiring vaccination to go to work, to go, you know, to have privileges to do certain things? And if so, there'll be a huge amount of pushback. It will be, you know, a huge libertarian argument of how dare you do that and all that. But if it sticks and it's legal, and if it sticks, it will probably push up the vaccination rates. It will, will take some of those people and take them off the fence because they do want to go into their work. They do want to go to a restaurant. They do want to go to, to a NASCAR. So we'll have to see how that goes. I think that's a that's the big political uncertainty as we go forward. So, so this is kind of effectively the COVID passport, as it's been called. And, and I think I saw from something you'd, you, you'd shared that some of the big kind of colleges in, in California are starting to require this now for their students and their faculty. So effectively, you can't come back into this setting unless you've been vaccinated because you present a risk to the rest of the people if you haven't been. And this might be the precipitate. That's the idea. Yeah, I, I always expected this would be a big issue. I thought it would wait until the vaccines were fully approved by the FDA. Right now, they're on, they have this conditional approval called emergency use authorization. And they're probably going to get fully approved, particularly Pfizer and Moderna, you know, in the next several months. I thought the two starting guns for this vaccine passport idea was going to be full approval by the FDA and enough vaccine to be available so that if you don't have one, it's your choice, as opposed to you haven't, your number hasn't come up yet. The fact that it started earlier than that, that there are currently several universities that are requiring vaccinations, in San Francisco, if you want to go to a San Francisco Giants baseball game, you need to show your vaccine card. Um, Los Angeles Dodgers are not requiring that you show a card, but there's one part of the stadium for unvaccinated, another part of the stadium for vaccinated, where they're putting more people in and, 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 and all. So you're starting to see it play out actually a little earlier than I thought. Just yesterday, my university, the University of California, which is enormous, I mean, hundreds of thousands of employees, uh, said that if you are a student or a faculty member or a staff member, you will have to be vaccinated. I think this is one of those that's politically tricky enough that everybody was kind of waiting to see who else is going to do it. And now that you start having some of the big players doing it, 
Uh, there are a few hospitals that are requiring its people to do it. I think more will. I, I think you're going to see some of the big businesses, um, uh, you know, say you can come back to work, but you have to show proof of vaccination. The hardest part of this may turn out to be the system by which we authenticate, because right now the system is I show my little yeah. CDC paper card, which I can buy one on the Internet for five bucks. So that's pretty <laughs> disheartening and silly. Uh, if it turns out that as a society, we embrace the idea that that uh, or at, at least the uh, some will embrace it. I think it's a good idea, but there will be pushback on it, no doubt. Uh, as that battle gets fought, clearly the 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 uh, the proof that you have been vaccinated has to be more fraud proof than a little dinky car that you can buy for three bucks online. So so kind of working that. Of course, we should have done that in the beginning. We should have created a, a system that created a digital passport and a barcode, but we're not that smart, and and so we're going to have to do a little bit of backtracking. Uh, this will be relatively easy for a business, particularly if the business provides you your health insurance. There'll be a little bit of a privacy argument of getting into your health records. But I think for a business to say we're going to require all of our people show proof of vaccination, it's probably not going to be the card. It's probably going to be a true information system. But the idea of needing to show your car to go into a movie theater or go into a sports stadium, we're going to have to do better than a little little card that you keep in your wallet. And that that. That issue of sort of dumb logistics and you know and, and 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 authentication may turn out to be one of the Achilles' heels of this. Uh, I don't. There's no. There's not going to be effective legal pushback. Business clearly has a right to do this. I think on ethical grounds, people will say this is just about me and making a personal decision about where I get vaccinated. I think that's not an argument that holds water as long as unvaccinated people are capable of transmitting it. To, uh, to vaccinated people, rarely. Uh, vaccinated people can get sick, rarely. We have a fair number of people who are kids, for example, that can't be vaccinated yet. We have people who are immunocompromised who have been vaccinated, but the vaccine may not have taken fully, so they may not be fully protected. So your decision about vaccination does not just influence you, it influences me. And given that, this is going to be the battle of 2021. And it's really interesting listening to that kind of dialogue coming from where I sit in Europe, where unfortunately we haven't got the vaccination rates up yet to be able to even really coherently have those conversations. We're talking about the topic, but much more in a kind of theoretical sense where you're talking about it in a real sense. So hopefully, frankly, we get to that point where we can have that as a real conversation. Maybe if we can. Well, I hope you use, you know, I, I hope you use the, the fact that unfortunately the EU has been so slow with vaccination as an opportunity to get the system together. So that you can, you know, if you decide as a society to check people's vaccine status, you'll be able to do it. One of the things, you know, Israel has been the poster child for vaccination in all sorts of ways. They, you know, they're, they've gotten most, almost all, all older people in the country are now vaccinated. I think there were 30 or 40 cases of, of COVID in Israel yesterday. I mean, the, 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 the rates have plummeted in a setting where most of the virus they have is the UK variant. So even in a setting with this 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 uh, more infectious, maybe more serious virus, they have completely stomped on the virus. And so uh, Israel has demonstrated how to do this. And to their credit, you know, very early on, once they got ahead of the race in vaccinations, they immediately instituted this thing called the Green Pass, where everybody has to show proof of vaccination to get into all sorts of places. And I, you know, I understand there's been some grumbling, but by and large, people have said, OK, and it's led to sky high vaccination rates and the society is essentially coming back to normal. And uh, it's interesting, the political arguments here, which are, you know, how can you make me do something? I want control of my life. Ironically, you know, to get control of your life, to get your life back to normal depends on all of us getting vaccinated. And so it's a, you know, it's a tricky argument to sustain, but, you know, um, no one should ever be shocked by partisanship in America. It's, uh, it's now just a fact of life. Well, just to console you in terms of kind of practical things in Ireland, where I, where I live, it's a paper card as well. Yeah. So everybody who's getting it vaccinated. So we're going to have the same issue of whether we have the technology to enforce a vaccine passport, even if we wanted to. Maybe if I could change tack a little bit, because I think a question people will be very interested in. All of this is predicated on the 
assumption that the vaccines keep working. The, the, the fear, the danger, the, the thing that we all worry about is that there's some sort of variant that comes out that's vaccine resistant or that the, that the vaccines really don't work effectively against it. What, what do you see as the risk of that? And should we should we be concerned? Should we be fearing these scariants, as they call it, or should we be uh, relatively sanguine? Uh, somewhere in between. I, I, you know, <laughs> I mean, we call them variants of concern because they are of concern. Basically, you know, what we've come to learn about variants is that uh, they can do three things that are important. And uh, some some of them do two of three, some of them can do three of three. Uh, the one is they can be more infectious. They can be more likely to spread. Uh, essentially, you know, everyone's become comfortable with that are not number, sort of how likely is it that a person will spread their virus to another person. They can raise that number, make it more likely that if you have it, you're gonna spread it to other people. The second thing they can do is be more serious. So if you get COVID with that variant, will you have a more severe case? The third thing they can do is evade partly or fully uh, the immune system. The UK variant, which has become the dominant variant in the UK, uh, in much of Europe and in the United States now, which of course is remarkable. I mean, it just shows what exponential spread does. You know, it goes from a brand new variant to becoming more than 50% of the cases in a couple of months, uh, which happened in the UK and has happened basically in the US. The UK variant is clearly about 50% more infectious than, uh, than what it replaced. Uh, it is probably more serious, although believe it or not, even after several months of research, that is being debated. There early studies showed that for a given case, it was more serious. Two very well done papers just came out and said, maybe not. So I think you'd sort of say probably a little bit more serious, but, but not massively so. The third is, are they resistant to the vaccines? And that's not an on off switch. That's not, uh, you know, it's either fully susceptible to the vaccine. You know, if you used Pfizer, 95% protection and 100% protection against getting super sick and dying. And now it's zero. That's not the way it seems to work. It seems that it, it by changes in the basically the biochemical configuration of the spike protein, the one that has to burrow into your cells, it can partly, you know, protect itself against the virus against the vaccine. And so what we're seeing by and large, is when we talk about vaccine resistance, we are talking about maybe the vaccine is not 90% uh, efficacious, it's 60% efficacious. There are relatively few uh, examples yet where the variants have demonstrated their ability to completely evade the vaccine. There is the, the most prominent one where it seems to be true is the AstraZeneca vaccine in South Africa, which is sort of the most prominent uh, variant that seems to evade vaccine. Uh, uh, does seem to not work almost at all. And what so what it, what it is what it means is when you get fully vaccinated the level of antibodies you have is not just a little bit more than you need it's 10 times more than you need. And so if the variants are vaccine resistant there will be some people in whom the level of antibodies they got is just not enough for that variant but other people it's still enough. And the other thing that gets confusing is we have two types of immunity, this T cell immunity you've heard about, plus the antibodies, we really only measure the antibodies. So even the ones that appear to be vaccine resistant, there may still be some part of your immune system that's working perfectly fine. That's a long way of saying, I think the biggest worry now is vaccine resistance. It is it's very clear in the UK and in Israel and now in parts of the United States that even in the face of the UK variant or the other variants that we're seeing in the United States that are more infectious, the vaccines win that race. If you can get people vaccinated, it doesn't matter that much if it's more infectious. If we didn't have vaccines, it would be devastating. And you saw that in the UK where, uh, you know, the way they discovered B117 was a bad actor was they were on a state of lockdown that they expected cases were going to come down and yet they were still going up. They had to tighten up the lockdown. So. Uh, it's it, so far, this is one of the bits, you know, there are a few bits of happy news in COVID, but one of the happy bits so far is the winning virus seems to be this one that is more infectious, but not particularly vaccine resistant. And the ones that are vaccine resistant don't, don't seem to be spreading as fast and also seem to be partly and not fully vaccine resistant. So what are the, what are the threats? Well, if, if you know these variants cropped up over the course of six months, there's really nothing in the in, uh, you know chiseled on a tablet 
that says there might not tomorrow be another variant that pops up that is as infectious as the UK variant and more drug resistant, vaccine resistant than the South African variant. That is possible. The likelihood of that goes up if there's more virus being spread because every time it's, it, it is a new case, a new spread, it's going through a replication cycle and it gives it a chance to have another typo and some of those typos turn out to be uh, create superpowers. So we have not yet seen that virus that we all fear, more infectious, more serious, and much, much more vaccine resistant. We have not seen that the relatively vaccine resistant viruses are as capable of winning the race and spread as the UK variant. Uh, but yes, that those those are the things if I have, as I look at the US today, I sort of look at a, a scenario where it really looks like we're going to come down to, as I said, this sort of patchwork of places like California, where there's essentially no virus, enough people are vaccinated. Other parts of the country where they're capable of having a mild surge because 30 or 40 percent of people aren't vaccinated, but relatively few people dying. Nothing looking like the surges of last year. But the nightmare scenario is a new new virus, a new variant comes in that is much more infectious and truly vaccine resistant. So far, so good. But uh, you know, but knock on wood. So, so it sounds like we, we, we really do need to be a bit watchful on that and the genomic sequencing and all that sort of stuff is really important. Maybe if I can take the more optimistic outlook there and that that variant doesn't emerge that causes us the huge issues, but we still have this kind of, if you pick the US, we have this regionalization because of vaccine take up. And then we have a kind of global environment where we have that anyway, because there isn't availability at the same levels in different places. How, how how should we think about this kind of playing out when in terms of a broad horizon and this is a difficult question but when should we expect that we might get back to a kind of roughly equivalent to pre-covid world or is that just too hard to tell at this point i think it's pretty hard to tell i mean i, I here's here's the, the the challenge is what does a pre-covid world look like who declares that we're there and um what is the level of covid in a in a region or in a, in a country that allows the country to say, both political leaders and people, to say, I'm not worried about this anymore. I'm going to go back to living life like 2019. Now, my shorthand for that, uh, the social scientists sometimes call about, uh, talk about revealed preferences. And, 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 and so uh, you might say to someone, there is a viral, uh, highly contagious viral illness out there that you can make go away and, and have no risk to you uh, if you wear a mask and wash your hands all the time. Uh, but uh, it kills 30,000 people a year in the United States. I think you'd probably get most people saying, all right, I'll wear a mask and wash my hands, particularly now because they now know they know how to wear a mask and wash their hands. They've done it for a year. It's, it's not as big a deal as it was. Well, that's called the flu. We've had that for the last 100 years. Uh, it kills 30,000 people most years, some years 50 or 60,000 people. And our revealed preference, I don't care what you would say on the survey, what we've demonstrated is we live life normally, despite 30 to 50,000 people a year dying of the flu. So you would take that and might very well say, we will go back to normal when the, the rate of death and disability from COVID resembles that of the flu. Uh, I think we could be there, you know, at the end of the summer or or in the early fall. The problem is, if you told me that uh, and said, you can take your mask off and go into this crowded bar and stand shoulder to shoulder with a bunch of sweaty, yelling people whose vaccination status you don't know, and your risk is really no more than it is during the flu, I'm still not going in there. And if I do, I'm wearing a mask. You know, and it's sort of like you think about how we think about terrorism now when getting on an airplane 20 years after 9-11. But think about how we thought about it for the first two or three or four years. It just takes a while to come back to, quote, normal because your your brain has been conditioned by a whole lot of anxiety, anxiety for, for, for now over a year. So I think that it, it, the psychology question may be the dominant question here rather than the viral question. I do think we're going to reach a level of death and disability that actually is comparable to the flu, meaning sporadic outbreaks, uh, particularly in states where vaccination rates are low, most cases being mild, some cases being more serious, 
People who get sick with a fever and a cough or shortness of breath and come to the hospital will be tested for COVID the way we test them for flu now. We, we haven't talked about it for a year. There now are some effective medications that lower the risk of dying from COVID a fair amount. They weren't the game changers. Turned out vaccines were the game changers here, but, but a fair amount. Your chances of dying of COVID if you're sick enough to come to an emergency room are probably down by half of what they were, maybe even more than that uh, from what they were a year ago. And so it becomes sort of a, you know, background noise in the world of infectious pathogens. You know, uh, you know, I take care of sick people in hospitals. Most of the patients I see come in with pneumonias and fevers and respiratory infections, very common. This will be another one. And, uh, you know, 10 years from now, we'll think about it just that way. Oh, this, you know, she's got flu, he's got COVID. Uh, but I think for the next couple of years, that's, you know, it's going to be very hard to decondition us to think about COVID in a very, very different way, a much more anxiety provoking way than uh, than the others. You know, the, the variants, again, become the, you know, the, 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 the curveball here. If if we knew that we were only dealing with the original virus, it appears that the vaccines are going to work for years, uh, that immunity is not going to wane very quickly. Maybe we'd be getting a booster every three to five years. But given the variants, we almost in, uh, invariably are going to have another shot in our future, maybe a shot every winter, and we're going to have the same uptake issues. You know, it's it, to get 220 vaccines into people's arms in three or four months in the United States happened in a setting uh, in which we're seeing this on the news every day and people dying in front of us. We know people die. When this becomes sort of a routine yearly shot, I mean, the percentage of people who get flu shots is not that high. Now, the flu shot's not that good, but that'll be sort of, you will have a new set of equations that we'll have to model out, you know, how many people, how bad are the variants, uh, and that may be seasonal. It may be like the flu. The variants change every year, so the vaccine has to re get rejiggered. How scared are people of COVID, about COVID? How many people will take the new vaccine? Maybe the old vaccine is still working somewhat, but not as much as it was, so you're partly protected you know, you're going to need better computers to try to model all that out for what this looks like two years from now. You could imagine it almost being like these, the, you hear about the, the flu, the flu variant that's coming through each year, but this year, oh, the COVID variant's bad. I'm going to get my booster this year. It's an interesting exactly. point that it's the psychology as much as the medicine here. Yeah, exactly. It's, I think that's right. I think it's going to change every, every year. And, and, and the lucky part is the technology that we use for the flu vaccine is like, 20 years, 30 years old. It's very antiquated. These, the mRNA technology that was used for the Pfizer and Moderna vaccines is spectacular, very easily and rapidly modifiable. Uh, you know, it basically is like changing the, uh, you know, changing the font on your, on, on, on your word processor. It's like, okay, we need a new letters to produce a new language. And I don't want to trivialize it. It's, it's a, you know, it's a, it's a brilliant invention, but it makes the process of coming up with a new and better and re-engineered vaccine substantially easier than what we've had before. Maybe to kind of take that comment about the flu and the mRNA vaccines, because to, to look a little bit beyond COVID, we've had pretty much no flu season in the US as much as, and in Europe, the same thing, the masking, yeah. the containment measures for COVID, they've just taken it off the table. And and then, so that's a bit real positive of one positive, at least of being a COVID environment. Another one arguably is these mRNA technology has been hugely effective. Could it be redeployed to other medical situations? So what, what do you think about kind of in a wider setting that the positives and negatives, kind of the second order effects beyond COVID from a medical perspective that we should be thinking about? Yeah, I'd say those are the big ones from a medical perspective. I think it's gonna be a fascinating question whether two years, three years from now, uh, you go on to a subway in the United States and, and you see a whole bunch of people wearing masks. You know, clearly that happens now in Tokyo. It happens in Singapore. It happens in Beijing. Um, I don't know enough about the American culture to, you know, there's there's such a macho streak in the American culture uh, that, that will people continue to accept wearing masks as a norm? Uh, that's an interesting question. I, you know, the, they may, as soon as, you know, it, it, COVID is declared sort of, quote, sort of dead in your community, they may burn their mask and just feel like, you know, I want to get back to normal. I don't want to see this mask ever again. I mean, for me, I get a respiratory infection every winter and then start wheezing. It's very unpleasant. This was the best winter I've ever had for 20 years. 
Uh, will I continue to wear a mask? I hope so. It's clearly the right call for my health, but you know, it's annoying and doesn't look good and all that. So I think kind of the social norms about that are going to be very interesting. If I had to guess, I would say the U.S. will not become a mask wearing country, but I think we'll have to see. And you're right. The, there have been essentially no cases of flu in the United States. So that's 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 a, only a tiny bit of consolation when 600,000 people have died, but about 30,000 who would have died of flu did not this year. And if we can get people to clean their hands more and wear masks, we'll probably get the flu rates quite low. I do think the what we learned about vaccina vaccinations and, and, and the MRA te te technology will be repurposed for other diseases. It always is harder than you think. I mean, it, it, uh, we can't overstate the, um, uh, we, we, we can't easily extrapolate that this vaccine technology worked magnificently for COVID. We found a vaccine in eight months, you know, all that. COVID turned out to be really an easy target. And uh, cancer is not an easy target. Uh, eight, you know, I interviewed this week, John Moore is a vaccine expert at Cornell who, uh, uh, who's worked on HIV vaccines for 30 years. Uh, unsuccessfully. And so, you know, it's not like they were dumb before and they're smart now. It's that COVID is a very easy target. It has this big, this big uh, spike protein sitting in the outside that plunges into your cells and hooks on there. And it's just sitting there waiting to be attacked. HIV, it is, it is burrowed in there and it mutates all the time. So uh, yes, I think it will be helpful, but I, I, I think People shouldn't be magical about this because we've got lucky. Again, hard to say we got lucky on COVID, but that this was really lucky. It turned out to be quite susceptible to a vaccine. We'll see if there are other infections that are as susceptible. But if you think about the mRNA, mRNA technology, it's just a new way of delivering uh, uh, the, the part of the pathogen into your body that gets your body to, to create antibodies. Seems to me a little bit unlikely that the MRA is going to be absolutely magic because we've had other ways of doing that. We just put piggyback them on viruses. And as we're seeing with the AstraZeneca and the J&J, &J, maybe they don't work quite as well. Maybe they potentially create some side effects, but we still knew how to do that, how to create an, an, an immune response. So we'll see. I mean, it's going to be very interesting to see. Um, you know, the biggest second order effects, I hope, in the United States and maybe around the world are a recognition of what a pandemic is and can do. This is no longer you know about what a pandemic is because you saw the movie Contagion or maybe read a book about the 1918 flu pandemic. It's now very real. People understand it. And in most parts of life, we underemphasize and underinvest in prevention because that's natural. You tend to focus on the things that are in front of you. I think maybe we will invest reasonably so that we're more ready for the next one, because unfortunately there will be a next one. Maybe it won't be for another 100 years, but maybe it'll be in five or 10 years. We've got to be ready for it. In the healthcare world, I mean, the biggest change is I think it's accelerated our technological transformation, um, telemedicine being the most prominent example, but I think there are others. I think, you know, healthcare has been pretty slow in becoming a digital industry. And I think this accelerated that that transition, which I think is ultimately quite healthy for for medicine, by you know by several years. So I think that that part's very exciting. And do you, do you see any other kind of sustained long term changes for the health system? Do you think there'll be a greater level of investment in the health systems? Any structural changes? And I'm particularly asking from the U.S. context, where it's got a unique kind of structure. Yeah, well, I think people are going to hate the pharmaceutical companies less than they did. And so that, that you know, they, 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 they were the heroes here. Um, you know, we invest so much in the healthcare system in the United States, it's hard for me to believe that we're going to invest a lot more money. But I can imagine repurposing some of the money, recognizing that in the U.S. healthcare system today, we spend about $10,000 per person on the acute care system, on hospitals, and doctor's offices and medications to treat diseases, we spent less than $100 per person on the public health system. And I think the recognition that the public health system, uh, you know, whether it's clean water or preventing infections or being ready for epidemics is really important. It's, you know, you go into a modern hospital like mine, the technology is pretty dazzling. People are paid well. You go into the average public health department and the technology is soup cans and strings connecting them. And it's, it, it's clear that, you know, that, that, that the healthcare system in the United States has very much emphasized taking care of sick people after they're sick. 
and uh, and that's been the focus of his research. And I think this may shift some of that investment and a recognition that we have to invest in prevention. I think there's been a recognition in the United States of healthcare disparities in ways that really people, they're not new. I mean, people talk about the disparities in COVID. They're, if anyone who's been in healthcare for a while, completely unsurprising, they're, they're no more vivid than disparities in cancer outcomes. But the confluence of George Floyd and the racial justice movement and COVID happening at the same time is, has led to a much, much greater uh, political movement and appreciation of, uh, of disparities in healthcare. So I think there's going to be a lot of effort to invest in poor communities and minority communities and, and invest in a way that appreciates that most of the risk, the excess risk that they have, some of it's from lack of access to fancy health care, but most of it is basic. Most of it is, can they get their blood pressure treated, their, their diabetes diagnosed and treated? Um, you know, what's the state of the schools? Those sort of things. Those are determinants of their health outcomes. And I think there certainly will be political pressure to shift some resources into those communities and address health equity and disparities in a way that was happening slowly uh, in the United States, but I think that has been accelerated by COVID. And I think I think that's going to turn out to be a good thing. No, th thanks, Bob. And, and I would say from that kind of the public health aspect, I think that's going to be a global change. I think there's a recognition, not just in the US, but elsewhere, um, uh, particularly in Europe, that the public health system has been underinvested in. And we reap the, unfortunately, the downside of that when we see a situation like that. I, I think that's a fascinating way to kind of finish this conversation, looking at that forward looking aspect around the health systems and what might be what might be the legacy of this pandemic. It's been an an incredible 15 months, as you said, with surprises along the way. You have been incredibly insightful for us at SCORE in terms of the learning and, and what we've what we've picked up from you in the conversations and also through your various kind of Twitter updates and, and other sources of um, information. So thank you, Bob. Thank you for your time today. Really appreciate it. That was a great pleasure. It's been, been interesting and fun working with you and your team who are really bright people. And when we meet, I always, it challenges me to think about things in a, in a different and often more global way. So I appreciate that very much. Thanks, Bob. Have a good day. So